Hey everybody, welcome back to Chem 104 lecture. We're starting chapter 8, which is on gases. It's another math intensive chapter, so if math is not your strong suit, I highly suggest that you utilize office hours, tutoring with upswing, tutoring outside of upswing if you know someone who has successfully taken the course, all your resources. Make sure that you use them so that you're good on chapter 8. We're going to be covering the properties of gases, gas laws, doing a little bit more stoichiometry. So make sure that you've got your calculator and a periodic table and you're ready to go. Gases are really important. One reason gases are important is because we're people. We need oxygen. Oxygen is a gas. Without oxygen, we stop being people. So let's talk about gases. We're going to start with the properties of gases. The kinetic molecular theory describes the properties of gases. A gas consists of small particles that move randomly with high velocities. So if you think about gases as a backyard filled with toddlers, maybe 20 toddlers, say it's a birthday party, they're all going to be moving in random directions and very, very quickly. They have very small attractive or repulsive forces between molecules. So we're back to gases now. That means that they don't really attract one another or repel one another. They kind of just don't even see each other. They just bounce right off of one another. Same with toddlers. They'll just kind of bump into each other and just change direction and keep going. A gas consists of small particles that occupy a much larger volume than the volume of the molecules alone. So if we were to take a volume of gas and get all of the space in between those molecules out, we'd smush it down to a really small volume. That's what that one means. So if you look at the container on the right hand side, if we took these six particles, just the volume of those six particles, there's the two green ones and the four orange ones, that volume is pretty small in comparison to the entire container. That's what that third point means. A gas consists of small particles that are in constant motion and moving rapidly in straight lines. So again, gases always moving, they move in straight lines. They have a Kelvin temperature. Remember Kelvin, it's one of our temperature scales, proportionate to the average kinetic energy of the molecules. So in this chapter, whenever we talk about temperature, all of the equations that we're using, you must use Kelvin. I'll remind you of how to go from Celsius to Kelvin when we talk about temperature a little bit later. Next, we're going to talk about the properties that describe a gas. There are four that we're going to cover. Pressure, volume, temperature, and amount. This table gives you kind of the breakdown of a description and the units of measure for each of these. It's a great thing to have in your notebook for quick access. We're going to go through each of these four properties in a little bit more detail. The first we'll start with is volume. The volume of a gas is the same as the volume of the container it occupies. So let's say that this container on the right has a volume of 4 liters. That means that the gas inside also has the same volume. If it were an 8 liter container, the gas would have 8 liters of volume, just like the container. Volume of a gas is usually measured in liters or milliliters. And it increases with an increase in temperature at a constant pressure.
increased temperature, that's T, leads to an increase in your volume, which is V. That's a gas law that we're going to cover a bit later. Moving on to temperature. The temperature of a gas relates to the average kinetic energy of the molecules of the gas, and it's measured in Kelvin. We can convert a Celsius temperature to Kelvin. You take the degree Celsius and you add 273. We talked about that a few chapters ago. I just wanted to remind you because you will need to do this when we start doing problems. When the temperature of a gas is decreased, the molecules have fewer collisions. And that makes sense. If you have less energy, which a decrease in your Kelvin temperature means less kinetic energy, then you're not going to be moving around the same and you're not going to have as many collisions. If you increase the temperature, however, that means you're increasing the average kinetic energy of the molecules. So you're going to have more collisions because everything is moving around more. The next property is pressure. Pressure is a measurement of the gas particle collisions with the sides of a container. There's several different units of measure for pressure. There's millimeters of mercury and tor, which are the same. Atmospheres, pascals or kilopascals, and pounds per square inch, or PSI. The gas particles that are in our atmosphere exert a pressure on us. And that's a special type of pressure called the atmospheric pressure. Remember that the air is made up of all types of gas molecules. Most of it is nitrogen, good amount of it is oxygen, and then there's a lot of other gases that fill in that last little bit. All those gases exert pressure on us. A tool that you can use to measure the atmospheric pressure is called a barometer. And its image here is on the right. A barometer has liquid mercury in it. Don't touch it. Liquid mercury is bad for you. When the gases in the atmosphere push down on this liquid mercury, it causes some of it to travel up this tube. The level that the mercury reaches in the tube is what you measure in millimeters. One atmosphere, which is just kind of the normal atmospheric pressure, is 760 millimeters of mercury. That means if you were to get out a meter stick and measure it, you would see a reading of 760 millimeters. Here we have an equality 760 millimeters of mercury is the same thing as one atmosphere, which is also the same as 760 tor. Tor is another unit of pressure that was named after Evangelista Torricelli, and he was the person who created the barometer. So he has a unit of measure named after him that has to do with measuring pressure. Makes sense. Since you saw an equality, you had to know that we're going to talk about the units of pressure. I'm going to give you um, equivalents to one atmosphere. And then we're going to do some pressure conversions. These top three are exact numbers. So atmospheres, millimeters of mercury, and tor are exact. When you're doing your calculations, these numbers do not contribute to the number of significant figures you report at the end. However, the remaining numbers for inches of mercury, pounds per square inch, and all these others, those are not exact. 
So if you have to do a problem with these, you have to take into account the number of significant figures in your conversion. This is another good table that you'll want to have in your notebook for quick reference. You do not need to memorize it though. Let's talk a little bit more about the atmospheric pressure. We said that it's the pressure that all of the gases in the atmosphere exert on us and on the Earth's surface and everything else that's on the Earth. As you increase your altitude, so let's say that you're sea level and then you like to go hiking, you find this beautiful little trail and you end up going up some mountain somewhere, right? As you hike up that mountain, the atmospheric pressure will decrease. So at sea level, the atmospheric pressure is about one atmosphere. As you increase your altitude, it decreases. So say you were on this mountaintop up here, the atmospheric pressure is 0 0.70 atmospheres, not one there's less atmosphere pressing down on you. So your pressure decreases. The atmospheric pressure also changes with variations in weather. So on a hot sunny day, like the days that are coming, the mercury column rises and it indicates a higher atmospheric pressure. So remember that barometer you're going to have a little bit more than 760 millimeters of mercury. On a rainy day, you've got less pressure. That mercury column is going to fall. It's going to be a little bit below 760 millimeters of mercury. This table just describes the altitudes of several places that a lot of people would know, like LA, Vegas, Denver, and their varying atmospheric pressures. Let's try a sample problem. A gas is exerting 0 0.280 atmospheres of pressure on its container. Express the pressure exerted by the gas in millimeters of mercury. I always like to start by rewording the question. I try to make it as simple as possible, a simple phrase or some kind of a math equation that shows me I have this and I'm trying to equate it to that. We're starting with 0 0.280 atmospheres. And I'm trying to figure out what that is in millimeters of mercury. Now that I know what I'm trying to do, I can figure out my equality. This is where that table that has all of the different uh, conversions for one atmosphere would be very helpful. One atmosphere is the same as 760 millimeters of mercury. Both of these numbers are exact. So when we're doing our problem and we end up with an answer, we don't need to take into consideration sig, sig figs from either of these numbers. Since we have an equality, we can write conversion factors. They look like fractions. So we take one number, put it on top, put the other one as the denominator, then you write the reciprocal. Now we're ready to set up our problem. Starting with 0 0.280 atmospheres, we need to choose the conversion factor that will cancel out atmospheres and leave us with millimeters of mercury. That means we need the conversion factor with atmospheres 
in the denominator. Make sure that the units cancel. They do. And we'll end up with millimeters of mercury at the end. To put this into your calculator, you're just taking 0 0.280 and multiplying by 760. With sig figs, which we need three, 213 millimeters of mercury should be your answer. I encourage you to try this in your calculator. Make sure you get the same thing. Now we're going to start talking about the gas laws. The first gas law we're going to cover is Boyle's law, and that talks about pressure and volume. Boyle's law states that the pressure of a gas is inversely related to its volume when T is constant. Remember that T is temperature. This little fish looking thing means inversely. That's what Boyle's law says. And that's only true when the temperature is constant. The product of the pressure times the volume is a constant when the temperature and the amount of gas held are held constant. N is the amount of gas. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. If the volume decreases, then the pressure increases and vice versa. So this is Boyle's law. You'll see P1, V1. Anytime you see a subscript of one in a gas law like this, it means the initial conditions. And then the subscript of two means the final conditions. In our example on the right, we start with a volume of four liters and a pressure of one atmosphere. This container has a piston, so you can push down on the, on the piston, and it will push down on the gas to decrease the volume. We've now decreased the volume to two liters, and the pressure has increased. But notice how the pressure times the volume stays the same. So when you multiply the pressure times the volume, you should get the same thing. And that's what Boyle's Law says. Here's a quick learning check to make sure that you understand Boyle's Law. For a cylinder containing helium gas, indicate if cylinder A or cylinder B represents the new volume for the following changes and we're going to keep the amount of gas and the temperature constant. So this is our initial. We're starting here. If the pressure decreases, what has to happen to the volume? The volume has to have the opposite happen. That means it's going to increase. Which one of these looks like it has a volume increase? That's going to be letter B. Now we'll walk through the second one in a different color. We'll do purple. I like purple. 
this time we have pressure increasing. When the pressure increases, the volume has to decrease. That has to be A. Make sure that you understand this because this is the kind of check that we'll need to do when we're doing actual math problems for Boyle's Law. Don't just rely on your calculator. Rely on your mind. Use your logic. If you know that you're doing a Boyle's Law problem, make sure that if the pressure is increased, that your volume is decreased. Check your answer. Did your volume decrease? Why should we care about Boyle's Law? Well, it describes kind of what happens when we breathe. So when you inhale, your lungs are expanding. That means the volume is increasing. The pressure in your lungs decreases. And air flows toward the lower pressure in your lungs. So that's how you increase the air in your lungs. When you exhale, your lung volume decreases. Boyle's Law says that the pressure in your lungs has to increase when that happens. and the air flows from the higher pressure in your lungs to the outside. So you're letting go all that carbon dioxide. You're releasing some oxygen too because we don't take it all into our blood. You're releasing other things as well, but the main thing is carbon dioxide. Let's try Boyle's Law problem. What I encourage all students to do when you are doing gas law problems is to first identify the gas law that you need to use to solve the problem. You're not going to have the convenient title of calculations using Boyle's Law to tell you use Boyle's Law. So I like to show you how to solve a problem regardless of the you know title and everything else. You need to recognize which gas law you have. I'm going to highlight the information that we receive and then go through and assign variables and from there show you how we can go from the variables to determining which gas law we need to use to solve. Freon 12 was used in refrigeration systems. What is the new volume of an 8 liter sample of Freon gas initially at 550 millimeters of mercury after its pressure is changed to 2200 millimeters of mercury at constant temperature and moles. Moles, that means amount. If you remember from chapter seven, moles is just number of things and it can tell you how much of a compound you have. So I highlighted a few phrases here. What is the new volume? We said that whenever we're talking about something new or final, that it has a subscript of a two. So volume two, we don't know. That's what the question is. We know that we're starting with an 8 liter sample. So that's V1 or volume 1. Initially, it has a temperature or a temperature. It has a pressure of 550 milliliters of mercury. Initially, that means pressure or P1. After its pressure is changed, the change means we are in our final conditions, 2200 
millimeters of mercury. And we're told that the constant temperature and um, moles, which is the amount of gas. All we have is pressures and temperatures. I keep saying temperatures. I don't know why I want to deal with temperatures. We're going to next. But my brain is just thinking about temperature. So forgive me. We have pressures and volumes. The gas law that deals with pressures and volumes is Boyle's law. Now that we've identified which gas law we need, we can write out what the equation is. And based on the information from the problem, we need to solve for V2. We do a little bit of algebra to rearrange the equation. Divide both sides by P2. Now, I like to group together the pressures and the volumes and the temperatures when I rearrange gas law problems. This makes the unit cancellation work out a lot easier, and it's just visually easier to digest. Now that we've rearranged our variables, we have to fill in the information that we know from the problem. V1 is 8 liters. P1 is 550 millimeters of mercury. P2 is 2200 millimeters of mercury. Now we can solve this. We should be getting something, some kind of unit that has to do with volume, so liters or milliliters. Our pressure units cancel. We're going to be left with liters. So that checks out. Do 550 divided by 2200 in your calculator. Then multiply that answer by 8. That will give you your calculator answer. With sig figs, we need two sig figs here. All of the information from the problem has two sig figs. You should get a volume of two liters as your answer. Take the time to write out each variable and the information from the problem. It may take an extra 30 seconds to a minute but it will guarantee that you are organized when you're doing your problems. One of the biggest problems that I see with students is that they don't take the time to organize the information and they try to jump straight from the problem to the calculator. You can't do that if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't know what you're solving, if you don't know what you're looking for. The calculator will always give you an answer. It just may not be the answer you need. So don't jump to the calculator. Take the time to write it out, convince yourself of what you're doing. Once you get an answer, make sure that that answer makes sense. To go from 550 millimeters of mercury to 2200, that was an increase in the pressure. Boyle's law says if you increase the pressure, you should decrease the volume. So our answer should be smaller than eight liters. And two definitely is less than eight. Always do the mental math check. Next, we're finally moving on to something with temperature. Charles's law, it's temperature and volume.
Remember that for gases, we're using Kelvin temperature. You take the degree Celsius and add 273, and that gives you Kelvin. There's no degree sign because Kelvin is an absolute temperature scale. The Kelvin temperature of a gas is directly related to its volume. And we can write that as a proportion. This proportion is Charles's law. The pressure and the number of moles of gas are constant here. When the temperature of a sample of gas increases, the volume is also going to increase. In our example, we start with gas that's at 200 Kelvin and the volume is one liter. We increase the temperature to 400 Kelvin and now we have increased our volume. Two times the temperature, two times the volume. Before we do an actual problem with numbers, I want to show you how to use Charles's law. Remember that this is a proportion but it's not really that easy to use unless you do one thing first, and that is cross multiply. So you take V1 and multiply by T2, take V2, multiply by T1. Once you've done that, you can solve for any of the variables. In this case, we're looking for T2. Divide both sides by V1. And T2 is equal to T1 times the ratio of V2 over V1. That's just one example of how to use Charles's law. For every Charles's law question, you're going to cross multiply first as your first step to solving for whichever variable you need. Now let's practice. A balloon has a volume of 785 milliliters at 21 degrees Celsius. Those numbers sound important, so let's highlight them. If the temperature drops to zero degrees Celsius, what is the new volume of the balloon at constant pressure in moles? So I've highlighted some phrases and numbers. Let's translate that to variables and assign values. A balloon has a volume of 785 milliliters and a temperature of 21 degrees Celsius. Those sound like initial conditions to me. V1, 785 milliliters. T1, 21 degrees Celsius. The temperature drops, so that means we are in our new or our final conditions to zero degrees Celsius. What is the new volume? That's V2. We don't know what it is. All we see here are volumes and temperatures. When you're dealing with only volumes and temperatures, it has to be Charles's law. Now that we've identified which gas law we need, we need to do two things. 
one we need to convert our temperatures from Celsius to Kelvin then we need to write out Charles's law cross multiply and solve for the variable we need let's start by converting our temperatures T1 is going to be 21 degrees Celsius, we're adding 273, and that's 294 Kelvin. T2 was 0 degrees Celsius, and we're adding 273, that's 273 Kelvin. Don't forget that step. If you don't convert your temperatures to Kelvin, you're going to get the wrong answer. There's your reminder. Always convert degrees Celsius to Kelvin for gas law calculations. Now we need to deal with Charles's law. You need to cross multiply. When you do that, that's what you get. Now we go back to our problem and what we've written out to see what variable we're solving for. And we need to figure out V2. Divide both sides by T1. and we get that V2 is equal to V1 times the ratio of T2 over T1. Now we put all our numbers in. Our initial volume is 785 milliliters. T2 is 273 Kelvin. T1 294 Kelvin. Before we touch the calculator, let's think about what we expect. To go from 294 Kelvin down to 273, that's a decrease in temperature. Charles's law says whatever happens to the temperature, it's the same thing is going to happen to the volume. So we expect that the volume should be less than, two, than 785 milliliters. When we look at our units, the Kelvin cancel, our answer is going to be in milliliters, and that's perfectly fine. Put it all into your calculator, and with three significant figures, we have 729 milliliters. That is definitely less than 785 milliliters, which is what we expected. Don't forget units in your gas law problems. This question could have asked for the new volume in liters, let's say, in which case you would have to take your milliliters and convert to liters. So don't just stop there. Make sure that you're fully answering the question. Next gas law, we're looking at temperature and pressure, and that's Gay-Lussac's law. Pressure and temperature are directly related, just like volume and temperature. 
we're also assuming that the volume and the amount of gas are constant. This is Gay-Lussac's law. It looks suspiciously similar to Charles's law. Yes. With our example on the right, we're starting with a temperature of 200 Kelvin in one atmosphere. We've increased our temperature to 400 Kelvin. That means that we're increasing our, our pressure as well. Let's do another practice to solve Gay-Lussac's law for P2. Once again, you need to cross multiply. That way you have a more usable equation. From there, I always like to identify what variable I'm looking for. Here I'm trying to solve for P2. So I'll highlight it or circle it or something like that so I know what I'm doing. Divide both sides by T1. And P2 is equal to P1 times the ratio of T2 over T1. Then if we were doing an actual problem, you'd put in your numbers and you do a calculation. So let's do that. You knew it was coming. At this point, you might feel comfortable to pause the video and try it yourself. If so, I encourage you to do that. Otherwise, you can just watch along and see how I break down the problem assign my variables, and then discover which gas law I need to use. Again, you won't have the luxury of a title that tells you what type of gas law problem you're doing. You need to identify the gas law you need simply by reading the question. That should be your goal. A gas has a pressure of two atmospheres at 18 degrees Celsius. Those sound like important numbers. What is the new pressure? Okay, that's what I need to figure out. When the temperature is 62 degrees Celsius, so that's a change, those must be my final conditions. And we're assuming constant volume and moles. Let's write it out. We said these first two numbers must be our initial conditions because it says a gas has these things. Pressure and its initial, that's P1. The problem says it's two atmospheres. We also have a temperature of 18 degrees Celsius. What is the new pressure? The new pressure is P2, but we don't know what it is yet. When the temperature is 62 degrees Celsius, that's our T2. The only things we were given from the problem is pressure and temperature. That means that we must use Gay-Lussac's law. This time, we'll rearrange the equation. Then, we will go ahead and convert our temperatures, plug and chug, and get an answer. We must cross multiply first. So I'll do all that work in blue. When you cross multiply, you get P1 times T2 is equal to P2 times T1.
our question is asking for P2. Divide both sides by T1. And if you're saying, this looks suspiciously familiar, it is. We did the exact same thing on the last slide. Sometimes I'm good at planning these things. Sometimes I'm not. Sometimes it's serendipity and I just claim it as my own. You'll never know which it is. P2 is equal to P1 times the ratio of T2 over T1. We know our equation. We have most of our variables, but we need to convert the temperatures to Kelvin first. We'll do that in purple. T1, we've got to take our 18 degrees Celsius and add 273. That gives us 291 Kelvin. T2, we're taking 62 and adding 273. And that gives us 335 Kelvin. These are the numbers that we will use in our equation. P1 is two atmospheres. T2 is 335 Kelvin. We divide that by T1, which is 291 Kelvin. Our temperature units cancel and we're left with atmospheres. That makes sense if we're solving for a pressure. When you do this calculation and you take into account how many sig figs you need, hint, hint, it's two, you get 2.3 atmospheres. If you're struggling with the sig figs, Go back to the chapter that we did sig figs. I believe that that was chapter two. I could be mistaken. It's either chapter one or chapter two. I believe it was chapter two. We're just looking at how many significant figures are in all the information that we have. And since we're doing multiplication and division, it's the same rules for figuring out sig figs. So we look at the 2.0, which has two sig figs, and each of these temperatures has three sig figs. We can only use two. Alrighty, moving on. We're gonna cover a few more concepts related to gases. The first is vapor pressure and boiling point. These are two different things. When liquid molecules with enough kinetic energy break away from the surface of the liquid, keyword being the surface, it becomes a vapor. That's just evaporation. If you have an open container, eventually all the liquid is going to evaporate. In a closed container, that vapor is going to accumulate and create a pressure called vapor pressure. So if you think about atmospheric pressure, where it's the gas above us pushing down on us, the vapor above the liquid is pushing down on the liquid in the closed container. That's vapor pressure. A liquid exerts its own vapor pressure at a given temperature. So there's a certain pressure associated with each temperature. A liquid will boil when its vapor pressure becomes equal to the external pressure. 
So if our external pressure is one atmosphere, the vapor pressure for a liquid, like say water, if you're trying to boil some water, it has to be one atmosphere in order for the water to actually boil. Boiling point is affected by altitude. At high altitudes, the atmospheric pressure is lower and the boiling point of water is also lower. In a closed container like a pressure cooker, the pressure is greater than one atmosphere, so the water actually boils at a higher temperature. The table on the right gives you the pressure and the boiling point of water. As you can see, if you have a lower pressure, like 270 millimeters of mercury, that's far below atmospheric pressure, one atmosphere of 760 millimeters of mercury, your boiling point is 70 degrees Celsius. At one atmosphere, or 760 millimeters of mercury, the boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius. The more pressure you can build up, the hotter the water has to be before it boils. What we're looking at in these images, the one on the left, we're looking at boiling water. It's 100 degrees Celsius. It's an open container. So we know that the atmospheric pressure that's pushing down on the water is 760 millimeters of mercury, same as one atmosphere. An autoclave, which is shown on the right, is used to sterilize equipment at temperatures higher than 100 degrees Celsius. So the pressure inside of an autoclave is higher than one atmosphere. That means that it's going to require a higher temperature to boil water. All the steam that you create in that autoclave is going to be super duper hot and it will sterilize all the things. So you see this used in the lab setting where you're sterilizing equipment or flasks and things like that if you're going to be growing cultures. You'll also see this when it comes to preparing um, utensils, but tools, um, surgical tools um, for surgery. This is a learning check that I'd like you to try at home. We'll go over these in class but I want you to give it a shot on your own just to see if you understand the gas laws. You're going to use the word increases or decreases to complete each of these sentences. And these sentences have to do with the gas laws that we've just covered. So try it at home. We're going to go over these in class when we do chapter eight. Now there's one more gas law which isn't really a new gas law, it's just combining all of the three gas laws into one. Hence, it's called the combined gas law. Very original name, I know. The combined gas law uses all of the relationships between pressure, volume, and temperature from Boyle's law, Charles's law, and Gay-Lussac's law. The only thing that's constant here is the amount of gas or N. We can use this gas law when we have pressure, volume, and temperature for a gas. Let's try one. I'll get my highlighter out. Here we go. A gas has a volume so we must be going into initial conditions, of 675 milliliters, that's the volume, temperature, 35 degrees Celsius, and 646 millimeters of mercury pressure. That's a whole sentence of initial conditions. What is the volume in milliliters? That's the question. If now we're at negative 95 degrees Celsius, 
and a pressure of 802 millimeters of mercury and n is constant it's a lot of numbers y'all that first sentence is setting up our initial conditions and chances are that's how it's going to be for the majority of the problems you're solving you're told about what the gas is where it is the pressure the temperature the volume what have you then the question is going to come in and say what is the new one if these things change hopefully you see that pattern by now let's write out all of our variables for the initial conditions we've got v1 is equal to 675 milliliters t1 is 35 degrees celsius we're going to have to change that to kelvin later on but we won't worry about it right now p1 646 millimeters of mercury what is the volume in milliliters clearly we're not told that so that's a question mark if our new temperature is negative 95 degrees Celsius and our new pressure is 802 millimeters of mercury since we have pressure volume and temperature it has to be the combined gas law The combined gas law it looks like Boyle's law and then you divide by temperature okay we're gonna do the same kind of deal as we did with Gay-Lussac's law and Charles's law and that is to cross multiply I'm gonna switch colors here just to break up the monotony a little bit now that we've cross multiplied we've got something a little bit more useful we look at all of our known information figure out what are we solving for this time we're looking for v2 we're going to divide both sides by p2 times t1 And what we get is that V2 is equal to V1 times the ratio of P1 over P2 times the ratio of the temperatures T2 over T1. Before we start filling in numbers, we have to convert our Celsius temperatures to Kelvin. For T1, we take 35 and add 273. And that's going to give us 308 Kelvin. For T2, we've got negative 95 and we're adding 273. So that's really like 273 minus 95. So you should get a number that is less than 273. 178 Kelvin now we can take these numbers and we can plug them into our equation
V1, 675 milliliters. P1, 646 millimeters of mercury. P2, 802 millimeters of mercury. Now we've got the temperatures. T2, 178 Kelvin. T1, 308 Kelvin. Make sure that the units cancel because you could have a problem where you've got pressure in millimeters of mercury and atmospheres. You can convert, but you would have to do that first before you put it into the problem. So always check all of your units. Make sure that your units cancel. When you do all this lovely math, you should get a volume of 314 milliliters. The next law we're going to talk about is Avogadro's law. And this relates the volume of the gas and the amount or the number of moles. In Avogadro's law, the volume of the gas is directly related to the number of moles. And in this case, we're keeping the temperature and the pressure constant. Avogadro's law is another proportion. So when we use it, it's going to be just like with Charles's law, Gay-Lussac's law, and the combined gas law you have to cross multiply first. When you increase the amount of gas, you increase the volume of gas. Let's do a sample question. If 0.75 moles of helium gas, that's, that looks like an important number, occupies a volume of 1.5 liters, what volume in liters will 1.2 moles occupy at the same temperature and pressure? So what do we have? Initially we have 0.75 moles and I abbreviate mole and moles with M-O-L. So make sure you get that. That's what I do. Sorry if it confuses you. I hope it doesn't. We've got a volume of 1.5 liters. Those are the initial conditions. What volume that indicates we don't know it, will 1.2 moles occupy? So our new condition is 1.2 moles. What do we have here? Moles and volume. So that means Avogadro's law. Cross multiply. And then highlight which variable you're looking for. We're looking for V2. Divide both sides by N1. And there's our equation. We fill in all of the numbers. 
that's V1. N2 is 1.2 moles. N1 is 0 0.75 moles. Our units cancel in our ratio. So our number is going to be a volume. It's going to have the units of liters. When you do the math, you should get 2.4 liters, which is letter C. Before you even do the math, you can rule out option A, and here's why. We're starting with the volume of 1.5 liters, and we are increasing the moles, which means that we're going to increase our volume. If we're starting with the volume of 1.5 liters, the answer of 0.94 liters doesn't make sense because we need a volume that's bigger since we increase the amount of gas we have. You can't tell the difference between B and C until you do the math, but you can at least say the answer isn't A. The conditions that we talk about gases where we can actually compare them is at STP, standard temperature and pressure. The standard temperature is zero degrees Celsius, which is the same as 273 Kelvin, Remember that when you're doing math and using the gas laws, you have to use the Kelvin temperature. The standard pressure is one atmosphere, which is the same as 760 millimeters of mercury. You can use any units of pressure that you desire. At STP, one mole of gas, regardless of the identity of the gas, has a volume of 22.4 liters, and that's called the molar volume. 22.4 liters equals one mole of gas. That's an equality. Wherever there's an equality, you know what I'm saying. There are conversion factors. And when there are conversion factors, you can do math. You can use these conversion factors to go from the moles of gas to volume of gas or the volume of gas to moles. This picture just demonstrates that you can have one mole of gas and it has the same volume regardless of whether it's helium, oxygen, or nitrogen gas. They have varying masses, but the temperature and the pressure are the same, which means the volume is the same. Now we'll do math. You know we can't talk about conversion factors without doing math. That's just completely unheard of. What is the volume occupied by 200, 200, 2.75 moles of nitrogen gas at STP? STP, that means that we have a pressure equal to one atmosphere, and our temperature is equal to zero degrees Celsius, which is the same as 273 Kelvin. So when you see something is at STP, that's automatically what that means. Since we're at STP, we know that the volume of one mole of gas is equal to 22.4 liters. That's our molar volume. If you don't see at STP, then you can't use molar volume.
these are our conversion factors. We need to choose the conversion factor that will cancel out moles and leave us with liters. We currently have moles in the numerator. Our conversion factor needs to have moles in the denominator. Our units cancel and we'll, we'll be left with liters. We need three sig figs here. Sixty one point six liters of nitrogen gas. The key to this problem is knowing that when you see a question about volume and your conditions are at STP, you have to use molar volume. Let's try a learning check problem. What is the volume at STP of four grams of methane, which is CH4? Volume at STP. That means we've got to use molar volume somewhere. But we don't have moles. We have grams. You have to remember chapter seven. We can go from the number of grams to the number of moles using the molar mass. And that is the first step of our problem. The second step will be taking the moles and converting that to volume using molar volume. To calculate the molar mass, we need to look up carbon and hydrogen on the periodic table. There's one mole of carbon in one mole of methane, and the molar mass of carbon is 12.01. We're going to add that to the mass of four moles of hydrogen. And one mole of hydrogen is 1.01 grams. Now we know one mole of methane is equal to 16.05 grams. That's our molar mass. We can write that out as conversion factors. Now we need to handle the molar volume part. That's our equality for molar volume. And these are the conversion factors. Now we get to write out the actual equation. We're starting with four grams of methane. With our plan, we said that we would start at grams and get to moles. Then take those moles and get to volume in liters.
for our first conversion factor, we're going to use one of our conversion factors from molar mass. It has to have grams in the denominator to cancel out the grams in the numerator. Our next conversion factor, we need to get rid of moles and be left with liters. Moles is currently in the numerator. We need to put moles in the denominator to cancel. Now let's go through and make sure that our units cancel out. The first step, we're getting rid of grams and calculating moles. Check. The second step, we're getting rid of moles, converting that to liters. Check. When you're putting this into your calculator, you're going to take 4 divided by 16.05 and then multiply by 22.4. you should get 5.58 liters, which is A. Don't forget that everything you learned in Chapter 7 that had to do with molar mass and doing those kinds of stoichiometry problems, fair game to combine with gases and gas law questions. Now we're going to cover the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law combines all four properties that we use to describe a gas. Pressure, volume, temperature, and the amount of gas. We take all of those and write it in one expression. Now I only listed off four things but you'll notice that there is a fifth character here and that's R. That's our gas constant. If you rearrange the ideal gas law, you'll see that the pressure times the volume divided by the amount of gas in moles times the temperature gives you a constant. We can calculate the value of R if you take the STP conditions that we talked about, 273 Kelvin in one atmosphere, and we know that if we have those conditions, our volume is 22.4 liters. You put all of those numbers in and you get 0 0.0821 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. So that is the gas constant if you have pressure in atmospheres. Now real gases do show some deviations, but the ideal gas law is pretty close to approximating the behavior of real gases at typical conditions. So it's a pretty nice substitute because it's a lot easier to work with. But let's say that you want to use pressure in millimeters of mercury. You can do the same trick and substitute in your pressure, temperature, volume, and one mole. Only instead of one atmosphere, you put in 760 millimeters of mercury. Then you can solve for that R. When you're working on problems with the ideal gas law, the units of each variable has, the, has to match the units of the R that you select. So if you're given a problem with the pressure in atmospheres, you should use the appropriate R value when you're solving. This table just summarizes the units for the R, which is the ideal gas constant. You don't need to memorize it. 
it will be provided for you on the exam. Let's work out a problem. Dinitrogen oxide, which is used in dentistry, is an anesthetic also called laughing gas. What is the pressure in atmospheres of 0 0.350 moles of laughing gas at 22 degrees Celsius in a 5 liter container? We've got a lot of stuff here. Let's start highlighting. What is the pressure? That means that's the thing that we don't know. Of 0.35 moles, we've got a temperature and a volume. We only have one set of conditions here. That's one clue that we're dealing with the ideal gas law because the ideal gas law does not talk about initial and final. We're also told that we need to calculate the pressure in atmospheres. That's going to be important when we're putting our equation together. N is 0 0.350 moles. T is 22 degrees Celsius, which we will have to convert to Kelvin. You add 273 to that, and that gives you 295 Kelvin. Our volume is 5 liters. We've only got one set of conditions and we have N. So the amount of gas is included. So that can only be one law. If we've got one set of conditions and we're talking about moles, it's got to be the ideal gas law. We're solving for pressure, and that pressure has to be in atmospheres. We have to choose the proper R constant. We need to use the R value that has atmospheres. That's the R value that we have to use. We rearrange the equation to solve for P. Then we put in all the numbers that we have. running myself out of room here. Now that we've got all our units and numbers put into place, we can prove to ourselves that we're going to end up with atmospheres. All of your units should cancel except for the units for pressure, which in this case are atmospheres. When you do the math, you should get 1.70 atmospheres. The big key to this problem is one, identifying that you need to use the ideal gas law, and two, using the correct gas constant.
as I promised, we can incorporate gas laws with chemical reactions and calculations. Gases are involved as reactants and product, products in a lot of chemical reactions. And usually the information that you're given for a gas in a reaction is pressure, volume, and temperature. We can use all of those to calculate the number of moles of a gas in a reaction. We can also use the number of moles of any other substance and the moles of gas to figure out how much product we can make. And that's going back to the mole-mole factors that we talked about in Chapter 7. So at this point in time, if you were like, mm, Chapter 7, stoichiometry, not for me, go back to Chapter 7. And review. You have to understand Chapter 7 before this will make sense. Let's press on. Nitrogen gas reacts with hydrogen gas to produce ammonia gas, which is NH3. How many liters of ammonia can be produced at 0.93 atmospheres, 24 degrees Celsius, from a 16 gram sample of nitrogen gas and excess hydrogen gas? Let's pull out some important information. How many liters? That means that we're figuring out a volume. We're told the pressure and temperature and the amount of nitrogen gas. So we need to find the volume of NH3 gas produced. Let's write out some things that we know. We've got our pressure of 0.93 atmospheres, our temperature of 24 degrees Celsius. Let's just go ahead and convert that now. Add 273 and you get 297 Kelvin. We also know that we have a mass of 16 grams. So all this is information about the nitrogen gas. If we have a mass, then we can get to the number of moles. And if we have the number of moles, along with the temperature and the pressure, then we can get to a volume. Once we know how much we make, then we can figure out how much we make of the product, ammonia gas. So let's get started. We're going to start by figuring out how many moles of nitrogen gas we have. We need to calculate the molar mass of nitrogen gas and find the number of moles of nitrogen gas. The molar mass is going to be equal to, we've got two moles of nitrogen in nitrogen gas and each of those moles is 14.07 grams. All 
I'm sorry. This should be 14.007. So that is our molar mass of N2 gas. We're going to use that to take our 16 grams of nitrogen gas and figure out how many moles that is. When you do that math, you should get 0.571 moles of nitrogen gas. The next step is to figure out how many moles of ammonia we make. You can use a mole-mole factor to take the moles of nitrogen gas and convert to moles of ammonia. As a quick refresher, when you're looking at a chemical equation, if you do not see a coefficient, which is these numbers out in front, you assume that it's one. So there's one mole of nitrogen gas used to create two moles of ammonia. The reciprocal of that is here. These are the mole-mole factors. So we take our number of moles that we calculated, and we choose the correct factor. We're trying to get rid of moles of nitrogen gas and end up with ammonia gas. When you do the math, you should get 1.14 moles of ammonia. Remember our units cancel we're left with ammonia. So that's the second part. Now we have moles of ammonia. But the question is asking for the volume of ammonia produced. What else do we have left from the problem that we can use? We've got a pressure, a temperature, and we have moles. That means we can use the ideal gas law to calculate our volume. Because remember, if we're doing this reaction at 0.93 atmospheres and 24 degrees Celsius, that's the same conditions that the product, ammonia, will be in when it's produced. Since we're looking for volume, 
we're going to isolate that, divide by pressure on both sides, we substitute in our values, we calculated the 1.14 moles, the R value we're using has to be the one with atmospheres because that's the pressure units we have. And the temperature, we already calculated the Kelvin temperature from the Celsius temperature that was given, and that's 297 Kelvin. We also need to add in the pressure at the bottom, which is 0.93 atmospheres. Everything should cancel except for the volume units, which are liters. When you do this math, you should get 30 liters of ammonia. Now I know we went through several steps here. I tried to color code them so you could follow along. First we figured out how many moles of nitrogen gas we started with. That was taking the 16 grams using the molar mass of nitrogen to figure out the moles of nitrogen gas. Then we wrote out mole mole factors which are in purple that describe the relationship between nitrogen gas and ammonia gas. For every one mole of nitrogen gas, two moles of ammonia are produced. Then we wrote the reciprocal. We use the correct one to convert moles of nitrogen gas to moles of ammonia. Third, we put together the pressure and temperature conditions that we were given from the problem with the moles of ammonia gas that we calculated to solve for the volume making sure to use the proper R gas constant that includes atmospheres as part of its units. If you take it slow and you go bit by bit, making sure to use your units and write them out, you'll do just fine on a problem like this. Now we'll move on to a less difficult topic I know stoichiometry can be a source of stress and anxiety for people. So we'll end on something a bit easier. Partial pressures, which is Dalton's law. This is where we'll talk about the pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide in our blood and hopefully adding on that health relevance will make this a little bit easier. So the partial pressure of a gas is the pressure that each gas in a mixture would exert if it were all by itself in the container. So let's say that we had a container of helium and argon gases. That's here. If we just had all the helium with no argon, it would be two atmospheres. If we just had all of the pressure from the argon, it would be four. The total pressure is six atmospheres, which is each individual pressure of each gas added up. So Dalton's law of partial pressures pretty much says the pressure depends on the total number of gas particles, not the types of particles. The total pressure exerted is the sum of all the partial pressures of those gases altogether. So all three of these exert the same pressure, one atmosphere. 
they also amount to the same in terms of number of moles. You have one mole of nitrogen gas, or you can have 0.4 moles of oxygen and 0.6 moles of helium. That's still one mole of gas, which gives you one atmosphere. And it will have the same volume of 22.4 liters because it's one mole at STP. It doesn't matter how many gases there are. If they all equal to one mole at one atmosphere, you're going to have the same volume too. The air that we breathe is a mixture of different gases. And I spoke about that a little bit earlier, like the very beginning, right? Most of the air we breathe is nitrogen and oxygen. There's a small amount of other stuff. The pressure, the atmospheric pressure, that's 760 millimeters of mercury, is the sum of all the partial pressures of all the gases in air. Let's solve a partial pressure problem. A scuba tank contains oxygen with a pressure of 0 0.450 atmospheres and helium at 855 millimeters of mercury. What is the total pressure in millimeters of mercury in the tank? And we're assuming that volume and temperature are constant. We've got oxygen at 0 0.450 atmospheres, helium 855 millimeters of mercury. We're looking for the total pressure in millimeters of mercury. So hopefully you see the problem. Atmospheres, millimeters of mercury. As they stand right now, we cannot add them together. The question is asking for the total pressure in millimeters of mercury. So we need to convert this 0 0.450 atmospheres to mercury or to millimeters of mercury. There are 760 millimeters of mercury and one atmosphere. Use that conversion factor you get millimeters of mercury. Now we can add them together. The total pressure is going to be equal to the partial pressure of the oxygen plus the partial pressure of the helium. When you add those together, you get 1197 millimeters of mercury. Now, if you've been keeping track with your sig figs, you might be saying, wait a minute, why do you have four sig figs in your answer when there are only three sig figs in both of these pressures? The reason is because when you're adding and subtracting, what you care about is how many places you have. And in each of these numbers, we have all the way down to the ones place. So when I add everything up, I can keep everything up to the ones place. So I can add on bigger decimal places, like the thousands, but I can't add anything after the decimal point. So I can't put 0.5 or 0.7. If that was a little bit confusing to you, then you'll want to review your sig fig rules for adding and subtracting.
You'll need those when you're doing partial pressure problems. Now let's link this to health. I had the carrot on the stick in the very beginning saying that we're going to talk about carbon dioxide and oxygen in the blood. We talked a little bit about when you inhale and exhale what happens to the volume of your lungs and how your lungs fill with air when you inhale and you release air when you exhale. When you breathe in you have all that wonderful oxygen. It enters the blood. The carbon dioxide is released from the blood. We don't want to keep that around. In tissues, oxygen enters the cells, which causes the carbon dioxide within the cells to release into the blood. That carbon dioxide has to get out somehow. The oxygen in your body flows into the tissues because the partial pressure of oxygen is higher in your blood than it is in the tissues. So it travels from a high pressure to a low pressure to kind of balance itself out. The carbon dioxide, it's the opposite. So we have carbon dioxide in the tissues that's higher and it flows out to the blood because the partial pressure of the carbon dioxide in the blood is lower. So the pressure of the oxygen is higher in blood. The pressure of carbon dioxide is higher in your tissues. This table gives you the approximate uh, partial pressures for oxygen gas and carbon dioxide gas in your blood and in your tissues. Remember that when your blood circulates it's giving all that oxygen to your tissues and when it returns to your heart it has to be, so remember, it goes all the way through your body. It's got to be oxygenated again and then pumped back through. So your blood is constantly being oxygenated and deoxygenated. So that means adding O2 gas, then it's giving it up to all the tissues and organs, and then it needs to be replenished. So these are the values for the partial pressures of oxygen and carbon dioxide. These are the other gases that we we're talking about, nitrogen, water vapor, right? And it's just a comparison of what you breathe in, what's in your lungs, and what you breathe out. This is the concept map for chapter eight. We covered all the gas laws, different properties of gases, kinetic molecular theory. So this will help to remind you of all the different bits and pieces we talked about today, the different gas laws. So you can use this kind of as a study tool if the concept maps make sense for you. If they don't, skip over it. No harm, no foul. Thanks for joining me. That was chapter eight on gases. Make sure that you tune in to the live lecture for more practice problems. And as always, you get details regarding assignments and exams. Until then, be safe.